This is College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. Hello, everybody. And uh, today we have in the studio someone who can clarify for us a number of the things that are happening in politics in America, <laughs> which are many uh, at this point. Although all politics always influence our life, I think that influences our life even more, at least at the level of conversation among people. Is um, uh, We have to, today with us uh, Dr. David Jones, who is a native of Madison, New Jersey. He, he obtained his bachelor's from Haverford, Haverford College, a very nice uh, college in, in Pennsylvania, and his master's and PhD <coughs> from the University of California in Los Angeles. Today, he's a professor and chair in the Department of Political Science at the Whiteman School of Arts and Sciences, Baruch College, City University of New York. Welcome to College Talk, Dr. Jones. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the first question is, why do you become interested in political science? Because when people hear the, the term political science, well, do, do, do these people want to become politicians? But actually, very few politicians have a degree in political science and to be mostly lawyers or, or, or businessmen. Uh, right. So how I became interested in political science um, has to do with, I think, just growing up in a family where every morning uh, as I was eating my cereal before going to school, uh, the radio was on with the news, National Public Radio. And uh, every evening when I came, you know, uh, my parents were make, you know, making dinner or whatever, the radio was on and the news was on. And um, I was just raised in a household where paying attention to current events was the norm. And I kind of thought that that's the way every household was. Of course, <laughs> it's not. Uh, and when you, the more you listen to uh, current events, you realize how much our lives are affected by governments and, and, and the interactions between government and, and citizenry. And so uh, I'm just always fascinated with it. <coughs> and it seemed natural to me. It was more confusing to me why <laughs> other people didn't feel the same way. <laughs> OK. Well, <coughs> basically, as we see, the US government today is basically three major branches. The executive, uh, basically the White House, the, the judiciary, beginning with the Supreme Court, and then the legislative part of it, which is Congress. And one of the areas in which you have done some research about the image of Congress, which doesn't have a very good image whatsoever, no. anywhere. I was wondering, is there a political consequence to that? Do they pay the price for not behaving as they should behave? Um, that's what uh, a lot of my research has uh, looked into that question. And, um, you know, before, before I started looking at it, the, the answer that was out there was, well, the average American, as I was alluding to before, doesn't really pay a lot of attention to politics. And one of the most confusing branches is the U.S. Congress, because there's 535 people there. It's much more difficult to get a grasp on than, than it is the executive with one person that you hear about all the time. And so that if people uh, don't, aren't paying attention to Congress, isn't, doesn't, they don't know what's going on there, how can that affect you know, their, their votes or, or their, their other attitudes? Um, my research interestingly found that people are able to use uh, kind of shortcuts to make some assumptions uh, that are reasonable assumptions about what's going on in Congress. That is, people actually can uh, ascertain when there's a change in party uh, control of Congress and they understand that that is correlated with changes in the policies that Congress is going to be pushing and that uh, people push back when the policy extremism of Congress moves so far away from their own preferences uh, that that actually correlates with drops in approval for for Congress mm -hmm. and as a consequence um, the majority party in Congress uh, suffers a, a penalty at the polls in, in following elections as their, uh, the overall rating of Congress drops. So people are, are smart enough to figure out who's in charge in Congress and hold that party accountable. And that was something interesting I found in my research. Now, <clears throat> this is a country that has a vote 
turnover, what in the turnover, very low in comparison with most countries in the world. And yeah, when there are presidential elections, you said around 50% or so people voting, but uh, still people who go to vote for presidential elections, they don't, for the most part, they don't know the, who the representative is, who they're voting for, what the platform are. And my question to you is, it is this lack of knowledge and understanding of who they're voting for part of the problem with American democracy? Um, uh, yes, but not in a straightforward way. Um, interestingly, if we focus on the narrow question of who's disapproving of Congress, the people who know the most about Congress and can answer those questions about who their member is, who's the party in charge, uh, are, the, are less approving than people who have very little knowledge. And there's some, there's some dispute about why that might be the case. You know, one theory uh, is that um, people who don't know very much about politics uh, just kind of pick the middle option and are neutral. Um, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt because they don't know what's going on. Another theory is that people who don't know a lot about what's going on in politics uh, use different criterion to to judge whether they're happy or not. They might just be interested in the state of the economy, and they're going to blame everyone in power if the economy is is poor. Um, but that's an interesting side effect. But I think you, you're asking a larger question about the health of democracy. And uh, yeah, I would say that from a personal perspective. You know, I don't like to see people complaining about what's going on in politics if that same person didn't inform themselves, didn't show up to vote. You had the opportunity to have an impact and have an effect, and if you choose not to do that, then you kind of lose your right to complain a little bit. So uh, certainly I, I, I'm sympathetic to that view. In the last six years of the Obama, uh, yeah, six years of the Obama administration, we witnessed gridlock and nothing was functioning. And the, I even saw some graphs showing that the number of laws passed by Congress was minimal in comparison with pre previous uh, um, eras. Is grid, grid lock at that level really new in, a, in, a, in American politics, or we have seen that before in the history of the country? Um, it's, there's some difficulties in going back too far in American history um, and trying to uh, count laws. Uh, you know, if we have laws now that are uh, a health care law, you know, if it's thousands of pages long, does that count the same as a three-page bill? You know, the, the laws used to be a lot less complex. So uh, it's kind of difficult to, to make these comparisons. But I would say, yes, there's been uh, periods in the past where Congress and the and the president have had difficulty uh, getting together and passing laws. So that's not a it's not a brand new phenomenon. Another question that I had for you is, <coughs> in this past presidential election, the losing candidate got almost three million votes more than the one who won. And people are starting quest questioning the whole idea of the electoral college which may be by the time it was created as a concept by the founding fathers and all those sort of things in the 18th, 18th century was fine, but in the modern world, it seems counterintuitive that the person who gets the fewer votes is the winner. Do you think that we need to reform that? Um, I mean, I think almost more important question is whether it can be reformed and um, I just don't see it as a very likely area of, of reform in American politics. So I, while I'm sympathetic to, you know, people who um, point out that it's, it's anti-democratic aspects of it, um, for me, that's not where I would, you know, put my efforts in terms of where to reform American politics. Um, we, we are in a period where politics is very closely contested. The two parties are, um, believe it or not, uh, of r roughly equal strength in the American population. And so that tiny uh, tips to one side or another 
can can make it look like well yes Republicans are in control of the White House and the House uh, and the Senate um, but really only by very small margins and so there are people looking ahead two years and it could tip the other way well whenever you have a, an electorate that's so evenly divided like that um, you're going to have a few instances in which the popular vote might not match the electoral college but for most of American history those examples have been very rare um, so there, you know, maybe we're getting into a period where it's going to become more important, but uh, it's been rare historically. And then secondly, you know, there's kind of two routes that people are talking about doing reform. One would have to be a constitutional amendment. Well, that's a very high barrier. Um, you have to get two-thirds support in both the House and the Senate to send it out to the states, and then three-fifths of the states have to, you know, ratify it. And in a closely <laughs> divided partisan environment, you know, uh, if Democrats propose this, Republicans would see it as, well, you're just trying to delegitimize the president from our party, and so they would react against that. And it would be very difficult to get these super majorities. The other route would be to have these, this compact among states uh, that some people are talking about now, where if you had enough states that added up to 270 electoral votes and they all agreed, by the time we get enough states that equal 270, uh, we states will give all of our votes to the winner of the popular vote. The states could do that on their own without a constitutional amendment. But again, then that's going to, the, the final states that are going to hold out there are going to be swing states like Florida or Ohio or Pennsylvania or maybe now Wisconsin and uh, Michigan. Because as swing states, they get a lot of attention lavished on them by the presidential candidates. Now, if they just agree to give their votes to whoever wins the overall vote, why are the presidential candidates going to come and visit them and make promises to the citizens of their state? So there's kind of a catch-22 there where uh, there's a logic to it, but I don't, <coughs> don't see the practical avenue through which it's going to happen. Another area that I think is problematic, and I don't think it requires a constitutional amendment, has to do with gerrymandering. The idea of draw this... Um, districts that will uh, support m more of uh, the candidates of particular uh, party instead of the other one to the point that there was a recent judiciary uh, decision and I think it was in Georgia where they said that uh, uh, the judge said you did this with a uh, surgical precision that will uh, uh, basically tell all of the people we don't like it's in a single district and everyone else is like in 20 different districts. Uh, it is to me surprising that something that, like that doesn't have a bipartisan uh, support to say, let's have a commission of neutral people who will really divide these this, this di districts in a, in, a, in a more sensible way. Is there any hope for reforming that area? Yeah. Um, a lot of the rules about how districts are drawn, uh, aside from b having to be proportional, uh, are left up to the states, and so different states have taken different approaches to this. Um, there are states like uh, New Jersey, I should know this, but I'm <laughs> going to go out on a limb. The last I checked, they had a bipartisan commission um, with an equal number of Democrats and, and Republicans uh, that drew their districts. I think that California is another state that's looked at this and tried to design more neutral ways of drawing districts. And so on a state-by-state -state basis, I think that's where this is going to occur. Um, and unfortunately, um, for s in some states, when one party gets, c the, the legislature gets to decide how the districts are drawn by passing a bill just the way any other law would get passed. And then it gets sent to the governor, the governor signs it. That's a redistricting plan. So a lot of it has to do with the partisan strength in a state and whether the party thinks that it can squeeze out more seats for itself. They draw their own districts, you know, for, so for example, Albany draws the districts for the state legislature and the state Senate and then also for uh, Congress. And so uh, it, a lot of it has to do with whether they think they can create a, a, a larger advantage for themselves uh, and their co-partisans both in the state and in Washington. Another practice that sounds anti-democratic, at least on paper, is filibustering. 
because basically it, there is a minority not allowing the majority to decide something. Uh, should we get rid of, of that kind of practices? Um, I think that the filibuster that where you where your <laughs> where you stand depends on where you sit <laughs> to put it uh, uh, briefly and what I mean by that is um, if you were a Democrat uh, you know during the last six years of the Obama administration um, you know maybe you were or his full term, you were frustrated by efforts to block things that he was doing. But uh, now you're probably, if you're a Democrat, glad to have a filibuster, and you feel that that's the only way to kind of stop this tide of, uh, of programs and policies that you think are going to hurt lots of people. So um, the filibuster, the po most positive thing to say for it is that it's a protection of minority rights and minority preferences that the majority, if you have just a bare majority, you can't run roughshod over other people in the United States who have preferences that are different than you. And it forces, in an ideal world, it would force the two sides to co reach more of a compromise before they can get anything done. Th there's some evidence of that. If you look at the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, Republicans, of course, uh, have been, and, and President Trump have been demonizing it as kind of the most extreme radical proposal. But if we look throughout the world, we know that that's not the case. You know, one of the other items on the table was uh, sort of a Medicare for all or a single payer system. Mm -hmm. And that was taken off the table because they knew it couldn't pass uh, in, in the Senate in particular. And so the filibuster requires... Uh, more moderation and compromise between the parties before something can pass. So but that's the price you pay is fewer things get through. So you have to decide which is a more important value and I think both values are important in a democracy that the majority should rule but also that they should be respectful of dissenting opinions and, and so the filibuster can play a, a reasonable role there. When I grew up uh, and I remember particularly in the 60s when I started to learn about American politics, you read these uh, stories of people from different parties who went out together, had dinner together, played cards together. Sure. Uh, they may disagree on certain things, but they always compromise in one way or another. They had a very civil behavior. But now that has changed radically, not only in the way they behave among themselves, but it seems they are always looking for this kind of uh, ideological purity that you don't meet certain uh, standards things are, are going to no, no, are not going to work so the question is what happened what made a civilized <laughs> system so uncivil uh, that's one of the most I think complicated and interesting questions in American politics these days and that we have a lot of interesting research coming at it from different angles I think part of the story has to do with the parties and what they stood for um, was more muddled and murkier in kind of the middle of this century, particularly kind of reaching the most confused point maybe around 1970. And th that's because we had a Democratic Party on the one side that a lot of its historical legacy was coming from the South and having um, kind of uh, anti-civil rights type of views and in some cases conservative views on <coughs> on um, spending and government size being a part of the same coalition with a uh, progressive uh, liberal tradition more from the north and and uh, <coughs> and the midwest um, uh, standing up for labor rights <coughs> for civil rights <coughs> and issues like this and and so the party was inherently unstable. That wasn't going to last forever. And, um, but while that, and at the same time, if you looked on the Republican side, less dramatically, you would see, you know, a state like New York would have uh, Rockefeller Republicans. And so Nelson Rockefeller, um, who was a, uh, a governor here, had policies that, you know, today we would call liberal um, 
And so the Republican Party had its own issues about that and what it stood for. So while the parties were this muddled, uh, there wasn't ideological purity, and so it was easier for members to see some commonalities with people across the aisle and to socialize with them. And um, So there's a sorting that occurred, and at first, I think, started to occur with politicians or elites, um, and then that's now we can see as the elites start to sort themselves out into more clear ideological lines rather than kind of traditional geographic and other reasons why the parties are, are were sorted the way they were. Um, the, that ideological nature just comes to the front. And then citizens start to notice that, and then that starts to affect the citizenry and how citizens uh, get along with one another and see each other in different camps. So unfortunately, it's starting to pervade American politics. Did the Civil Rights Act make the Democrats to lose the South, as Lyndon Johnson had predicted? <clears throat> um, yes, um, but if it wasn't that, it was probably going to happen anyway. Um, I think if a few, you know, if we ask, if that's a question a decade ago, I think unanimously everyone would say yes. There's a lot of research now that has done a little more detailed analysis of the parties at the local level and seen that Democrats already on a local level were starting to align much more clearly with the civil rights movement. Uh, a lot of this was driven by unions and uh, wanting to increase union power and then therefore you know, standing up for um, uh, African Americans in, in, in urban areas in the North. And that that's where then those interest groups put pressure on the politicians uh, who were both in the state and going to Washington to stake out this pro-civil rights position. And then that kind of put it out there for other politicians on the national level to take a side. So I think it was a long time coming, um, but certainly that is a key inflection point in American politics, the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act. And yeah. I always tell my students in Intro to American Government, and there's so many graphs you can show about that as, as an inflection point. It's clearly a key moment in American politics. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question that a lot of people keep asking yet, because I don't think there's a clear answer. How come the polling companies got it so wrong, and I mean really wrong, in the past presidential elections. What happened there because even the conservative one got it also wrong? Well, I guess I, I would start my answer by pushing back a little on the premise. Um, and that is, if you look at, first of all, uh, all of the polls said that Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote and she did win the popular vote. <laughs> so certainly we can't say they're egregiously off. And then the question is, well, what about the margin of error? Well, if you look at the final pre-election polls, just on the popular vote, um, <clears throat> they, on average, they probably added up to maybe a four-point victory for Hillary Clinton. Well, the reality is she's going to end up, she has ended up winning by about two percentage points in the popular vote. So two points off, if we look historically at how the polls have done in last elections, actually the polls were further off in 2012. They predicted a very narrow Obama victory and ended up winning by quite a large margin. Um, and so, you know, predicting a one-point victory and he ended up winning by about four points. So they were actually, the polls were, did a worse job even just four years ago than they did this year. I think the big difference this year, again, as, as we said earlier in this discussion, was the closeness of American politics means there's this divergence possible between the popular vote and the electoral college. And so what we really want to know is what went wrong in states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, which were the key ones that turned the outcome different. Um, and so there is an element that we, that we do need to address about what went wrong in the polls. but. We don't want to oversell it and say the polls are broken and they didn't work. They did a better job this year than in some previous years. I hear an explanation which is intriguing to me, which is the polling, all these polling companies that were so afraid of looking different from the others that they were imitating each other in terms of the same approaches and the same methodology mm -hmm. instead of 
taking a, a more diverse, being less afraid of not going with the crowd. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. There's this herd mentality where if everyone ha has a four or a five point lead for Clinton going into the last weekend and something happens, of course, the, uh, an election is dynamic and that something could be an announcement from the FBI yeah. uh, or something like this. And all of a sudden, your last poll has it tied or a one-point lead. You're nervous because you can't see, well, is, is everyone else's last poll going to be like this? And so there's a tendency not to change what the numbers are. But when you're polling an election, it's not just what a fixed population thinks. You want to know what the population that's going to show up the polls is. So there's there's likely voters. There's some guessing yeah. about who is a likely voter. Mm -hmm. And it's not guessing. We ask questions about have you voted in the past? What's your level of interest and things like this. So there's a science to it, but there's also a little bit of an art. And so if you if you are nervous about being an outlier, one of the ways you could do that is tweak your likely voter model or, or do other things. Uh, on the margins to to minimize that. So I do think that's part of the problem. But my answer also hinted at, at another answer, which is floating out there, uh, and I'm sure may, maybe you were just going to ask me about, and that is, did these letters from uh, Comey and the FBI play a difference? And I think that that has to be considered one factor. As we said, elections are dynamic. What's the th When we went down to the last week, if you look at some of these polls, they asked, you know, do you have a preference or you're undecided? The undecideds were incredibly high late into this election, and that was very different from many other elections. And a lot of journalists who were covering it didn't appreciate that fact. They were just focusing on who was ahead and who was behind and ignoring the fact that there were maybe 8% of the public that were going to make their mind up at the last minute. So that's a big number, and it means that, um, you know, they might be very different than you and I would be who may be paying more attention or have stronger preferences. If you're that on the fence, that means almost anything could, could push you one way or the other. So if the last thing you're hearing about is, oh, Hillary Clinton's emails again, and I don't want to keep hearing about this for the next four years, believe it or not, that could cause that final group that's waiting to decide to swing decisively in one direction rather than another. And I think there's some evidence that that's what happened. And the polling can't catch that late action as well um, as, as you know, the actual reality that's going on on the ground. Yeah, the email story got a lot of traction that despite the fact there wasn't really anything in uh, the significance behind that. That's what we hear. But the, but the groping video, which was real, right. didn't seem to affect the same in the same way. So... Is the American, at least a part of American electorate, really don't caring about those certain issues? Um, I think that if the election had taken place the week after the Access Hollywood video, uh, I think Hillary Clinton would have won fairly decisively. So I don't think it's that no one cared. I think that people have a short memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that it's it's what's going on right now and what's at the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, that may be hard to believe, but there's so much evidence that that's the case, that these effects rise up and then they diminish very quickly. Yeah. Think about the convention bounces yes. that we've all heard about. Yeah. Uh, the candidates move up in the polls by eight or ten points, and then within two weeks they're back down to where they were yeah. before the convention. So these are similar events, believe it or not. Well, thank you very much. We have many more questions, but half hour flew, <laughs> and, uh, and because it's a, I think it was very illuminating um, uh, answers that you gave about issues that affect all of us. And next week, we're going to have Dr. Thomas Teufel of the Department of um, Philosophy, who will be talking about philosophical issues in the 21st century. So stay tuned. This has been College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a production of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. All rights reserved, 2017.